Did I question the stars that appear in my eyes of this? Okay, I'll, I'll go pretty darn quickly Do, through some things um, then. You gonna have any trouble pulling it up? No, I don't think so. Don't worry. Just want to make sure. So when, when I, when I, oh. once you come up, yeah. I'll put the screen down and then once you do. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs>
Hello. Call the 715 uh, public hearing to order. Application filed on behalf of the American School for the Deaf for the historic restoration and reconstruction of the Gallaudet Monument to be located on the front lawn of the school campus at 137-139 North Main Street. The application includes associated landscape amenities and site lighting. Roll call, Ms. LeBrow. Ms. Blanks. Ms. Cantor. Here. Mr. Davidoff. Here. We have Mr. Donatelli as alternate for Ms. Fay. Here. Mr. Gold. Here. Ms. Kerrigan. Here. Mr. Sweeney. Here. Mr. Winograd. Here. And Mr. Williams. Here. Thank you, Ms. Lebrow. Uh, we have a presentation from the applicant. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have a live interpreter with me. Can you hear me? Can you hear the interpreter? Not, not, not yeah, yet. Not we're, no. we're, the we're, mic. we're working on the microphone. How about now? That's Can you hear the interpreter? Yeah, that's better. Are you able to hear uh, me? Uh, I, can. I can speak I can, up. Can, Just can let be. me know. Okay, I'll speak a little louder. Can you hear me now? Okay, I'll speak a little louder. Thank you. Okay, this is Jeff now. I'm so sorry. I just landed. I came here from a conference in Florida. And then I found out that I had no inter live interpreter, so I now <laughs> use an interpreter through my FaceTime. I'm Jeff Braven. I'm the executive director at American School for the Deaf. I'd like to discuss the monument a little bit before I introduce these people. The original project that we had first wanted to do with the old Gallaudet building when that was taken down was to restore the cupola. Was that on top of that building? So we moved the cupola to another place, but over the years, it's now been seven years since the building had been taken down, and we found that the cost was going to be exorbitant to re renovate that cupola. So we realized it was going to be an impossibility financially to do that. And we also have a beautiful land monument that was damaged during the previous building before they moved it onto here. It was in Asylum Avenue. So we preserved the monument beside the auto body shop for many, many years. It's laying there again. So we made the decision to talk to our alumni who had donated money for the cupola. And they agreed to transfer the money in the donation instead of to the cupola, but instead to renovate that monument. We feel it has more significant meaning to the school. Because as you know, Gallaudet was the first teacher of the school, so we decided to do that. So we found a wonderful conservator. His name is Mr. John Stewart. Again, really, it was a wonderful find. He came here, we started discussions. We have a wonderful landscape architect, excuse me, it was Francis Miller and then John Stewart is the, again, so he's going to be involved with this. Again, we really feel that this is very critical to show again the, uh, the monument, to be showcased in front of the school and showing a true connection to the American School for the Deaf, to the community. So I will let these gentlemen explain a little bit more, and hopefully this will get approval tonight. And I thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, my name is Francis Miller with ConserveArt, and um, I have a quick presentation. Uh, I'm going to go through this very, very, very quickly um, as soon as I get it up to slideshow here. Okay, so um, the Gallaudet Monument, we're here for the, the restoration of this historic artifact. It was uh, created in 1854, and uh, I'm quickly going to talk a little bit about myself so you understand my perspective um, on this uh, monument when approaching it. Uh, I, I have uh, 30 years of conservation treatment uh, as an as, uh, objects conservator, primarily treating outdoor sculpture and monuments. I work on a lot of traditional sculpture and stone and, and metals. Uh, both contemporary uh, and also modern contemporary sculpture in a huge variety of materials. Uh, a lot of monuments, large-scale monuments, uh, doing research, analysis, and treatment. 
um, historic cemetery preservation, which I, I, I love, particularly colonial burying grounds, fountains, and, and a, a huge array of other objects. Um, and I have to say that the, his, the Gallaudet Monument is, is one of the most fascinating monuments I've encountered, um, both historically and socially. It's just a, a remarkable piece. Um, I worked with um, the school um, with their archives, and they um, developed uh, a historic timeline for the monument, uh, giving sort of the development of the school itself and the history of the monument. And from that, that I, I based my uh, historic significance uh, research and, and sort of treatments, um, weaving a little bit of that information uh, into it. Um, now, Reverend Gallaudet is just a treasure um, for, for our nation. Um, just to read uh, from the timeline some of his accomplishments. Uh, he collaborated with Mason uh, Fitch Cogswell, Dr. Cogswell. Dr. Cogswell's daughter, Alice, lost her hearing due to illness, and he was ab able to get Reverend Gallaudet to travel to Europe with him where they visited um, schools in, in Europe and, and met um, uh, Laurent Clerc in 1816 at the Paris Institute um, of the Deaf. And then they co-founded the Connecticut Asylum for the Education of the Deaf and Dumb Persons in Hartford in 1816. So in a very, very quick time, they were able to mobilize and, and actually start a school. Their doors opened in 1817 with seven students, including Alice Cogswell. And then from 1818 um, to 1851, he directed the school for a number of years. And then after he gave up uh, his leadership, he still remained on, on the board until his death. Um, ASD developed uh, standardized American Sign Language. And, um, and it remains uh, the oldest continuously operated school for the deaf in the United States. So quite a, quite a remarkable um, accomplishment for Gallaudet and, and the school itself. Um, Albert Newsom, after his death, they decided to create a monument for, for Gallaudet. Albert Newsom was a very accomplished deaf artist. Um, he was known for elevating the art of printmaking making in the United States. And he um, is actually one of the it's fairly interesting because he worked primarily in flat work, but uh, his design for the monument um, is really a, one of the first public monuments with public sculpture uh, in, in the country. It's a very early monument for, in, a, in, a, in a public sphere um, outside of a cemetery, right? So this would have faced, um, you know, the broad, broad street in, in, in Hartford with a lot of public uh, interaction, and it functioned very much as a public uh, object. So that, that, that's really intriguing. And then John Carlin was also an accomplished deaf artist, and he uh, designed the relief sculptures for the monument. They are carved um, by, by an Italian stone carver. Um, it's interesting and, and notable that his design for the relief sculptures really breaks from the, tr the tradition of like the Beaux-Arts and sort of um, uh, real formal uh, art design at the time. And rather than depicting Gallaudet in full sculpture, let's say standing on top of this monument, he has Gallaudet seated down at eye level and, and he's actually teaching um, signing to, to, to the students um, seen there. And so that's kind of a remarkable break in tradition for art history. And the relief sculptures on the front um, panel and on the back um, panel is actually Gallaudet spelt um, out in, in, in standard um, signing, uh, spelling his name, which is really wonderful, the manual alphabet, which is probably the first ever in this nation. And there's also an interesting link with Daniel Chester French. Um, he was one, certainly one of the prominent American sculptors um, in, in, in the nation in that period. Um, he created the Gallaudet um, statue at Gallaudet University now, um, but it was based on Carlin's design. And it was also interesting um, that uh, the World's Columbian Exhibition is one of the key moments for, for Daniel Chester French. Um, and uh, the leader of the city beautification mu movement, and he made the uh, seated Lincoln, which I thought was kind of interesting, working again with a seated figure um, at the Lincoln Memorial. 
Uh, James G. Batterson was the monument manufacturer. Uh, he was a very notable person in this region. Made uh, monuments like the Worth Monument in New York City, the Colt Monument here in Connecticut, the Soldiers National Monument in Gettysburg, Soldiers Monument at Antonium National Cemetery, which is quite enormous. It's, I think, over 20 feet tall, the figure itself carved in granite. Uh, he supplied the granite in, in, in works for the Connecticut State Capitol and the Library of Congress when they added a, a huge addition. Uh, he's also the founder of Travelers Insurance Company and contributed to the development of the Wadsworth Anthenaeum. So uh, just another really interesting key figure for that period, uh, not only regionally but nationally, that, that was involved in this project. Now the monument itself is... It's sort of an elegant, small... It's, it, it, it's stately, I'll say. It, it stands about 20 feet tall. It originally had an iron fence... Uh, around the base um, with granite gr granite posts at the end. Um, it had a slight mound to it and a very, very simple simple path, footpath around, around the base. Later, the, the fence went missing and nobody has any record of what happened to it. And um, this is an enlargement of the previous photograph. And then I realized that um, the, that monument in the background is actually the monument to Clerk, which was made in 1873. And I think the fence was probably removed for accessibility and for design fashion at the time. I don't think they no longer wanted to have a monument with a cage around it, keeping the students and visitors away from the site. And so they... Um, they kind of brought the two monuments together more cohesively and aesthetically um, in, by removing the fence. And uh, the, the whereabouts of the fence is completely unknown, <laughs> or any of the parts. But fairly early on, in, in 1874, there was a letter by Carlin um, the one that had designed the sculptural relief panels, uh, he noted that the monument was in disrepair. By 1892, there's a letter, which was pictured above, um, from um, the American School for the Deaf to Batterson uh, Company, asking them to send an agent of your firm to come and examine the monument to see if it can be repaired in good working order. Um, so it, the marble itself just was not withstanding New England weather. And, um, and you'll see that it, it ended up just shattering uh, at the lower base. Uh, and this is also an interesting component of the monument. In uh, 1917, a delegate, um, delegates from France came uh, to the U.S. I mean, this is it, in the throes of World War I. So it's quite a gesture to cast some bronze pieces and come across and, and give them to the school. The, these... Um, Bronze uh, emblems were given um, to the school for the 100th anniversary uh, of the American School for the Deaf. Deaf. Um, it's just a, a wonderful little side aspect to this. But here's the lower base. You can see how fractured it is from the same monument. Um, the photographs that you had just seen, um, the school has been uh, dismantled. Oops, this doesn't like to go backwards. Sorry about that. Um, at that point, the school had been dismantled and is moving to West Hartford. So in 1919, the monument it was dismantled. Um, the marble was placed in storage in a barn uh, in West Hartford. Uh, ASD had approved that and, and knew about the location, but had sort of forgotten about it over the decades. The, the bar relief of Reverend Galley, that teaching was placed at the entry of the new school. And then from 1922 to 1924, a chip fund started um, to sell chips from the monument, all the fragments, to raise money for replicating um, Daniel Chester French's Gallaudet statue, because it was a, a more contemporary sculpture. They thought it would bring the school up to more contemporary standards. So little chips were sold from those little, you know, the, all those fragments to raise money. Uh, then things just went into disrepair as far as trying to keep these uh, objects safe. They were brought to the school um, and put in storage behind their um, repair facilities, um, their yard. And um, here, here's an example of the condition now. 
of the monument. The, the lower uh, granite bases are missing, um, but you can see how, just how fractured the lower portion of the monument is. It's, a, it's really beyond repair. Fortunately, the text plaques, there's a text plaque that on either side that was also designed by Carlin. They're in fairly good condition and we can uh, preserve these. And the uh, entry um, relief sculpture is intact in good condition at the entry uh, of the school now. Um, in the back panel, we have one small fragment of the E and the T at the very end of Gallaudet, which is really wonderful. Um, uh, so at least we have a sample of what that, what that design was. And this is the only sample of, of that design. There are no photographs that we can find or drawings. Uh, th this is the upper column of the monument and the uh, top globe, just minor cracks and some losses. And so the idea is to follow the U.S. Secretary of Standards for the preservation of, um, uh, of objects. And we're actually going to use all of these different um, approaches in the restoration, all preservation, restoration, reconstruction, and rehabilitation. It's, and then that adds to the sort of delight of this project and how complex it really is. Uh, the objects themselves, um, I did a condition assessment um, and we're con we have conducted the historic research. Um, when treatment does proceed, um, it'll be, consist of cleaning the, of the upper portions of the monument, consolidating the marble to give it a little strength, inject cracks, um, fill all losses and crack lines, um, replicate the, miss the lower portion of the monument uh, in granite, and then reset um, all in a new new location. It'll be pointed and uh, a lot of conservation reports will be generated. So yeah, here's a picture of the monument um, before it's moved so you can see the whole scale. So I, I didn't know when I saw the fragments um, behind uh, the yard at the school, um, I was trying to figure out what I was looking at in this historic photograph was great. So I can identify each course, uh, number them, dimension it, and then all of that was given to um, Rock of Ages for pre preliminary drawings and cost estimates for redesigning and reconstructing the granite. Now the um, relief sculpture, we are going to take a mold and have it cast in bronze. That's the most pre precise way to try and replicate the artist's carving. Even if we were to try and scan and digitize it, it goes through such extensive processes because then it has to be cut out by a CNC machine, and then a mold is made of that. Um, and, and yet every time you reproduce an object, you lose some of the, the, the detail. So this is the most direct way of actually replicating it and keeping the original safe indoors. Uh, and that small uh, fragment we have from the Gallaudet um, panel on the back, um, we're going to work with the deaf community to um, complete the design and have it re-sculpted and then also cast in bronze. Uh, the original um, French emblem um, was removed from the monument um, and placed on the Gallaudet statue. This is the replica of the Gallaudet statue that's at Gallaudet University. Um, I think this was installed in 1925, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they put the emblem on, um, I, I think, a couple decades ago, possibly. So, but we'll make a mold, replicate it, and put the original back onto the, um, the marble column. So then we're also working just a wonderful landscape architecture firm, and um, John Stewart will take it from here on the, uh, the design of the, the placement. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is John Stewart, I'm a landscape architect with the firm uh, CR3 Studios at Larero Engineering. Um, Francis, can you switch it over? To, do you have the site plan on here? Well, yeah, because there it is. Uh, Why is it not? Okay, hold on. Well, while he's doing this, okay, there. there we go. And there's a detail yeah. if you want that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so you can back up if you can toggle between the, the arrows. Gotcha. 
So this is a site plan. I'm sure all of you have driven by the ASD. You're very familiar with the front entrance. On the right side of this, this is the avenue, if you will, which leads up to the, the, admin, the new administration building. Um, the, 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 the green ellipse, if you will, at the front along uh, North Main Street is the existing planting and the existing three signs. At the other end, sorry, at the other end is what is known as the Tiger logo. Um, that portrays not the Tiger logo, but the new ASD logo, which will eventually replace it. There is an axis that runs from North Main Street through the front uh, entrance signs, the, the center sign identifying the ASD, through the Tiger logo, through the parking lot, through the GCED, all the way back into the back. And so that axis is what the, uh, we have selected to put the, uh, the reconstructed monument on, approximately 120 feet back from North Main Street, which allows an area uh, to separate the monument from the entrance sign, uh, signage, I should say. Um, the the uh, uh, monument is elevated. Well, what we've tried to do in, in the site plan is, is pull as many of the elements that uh, Francis described in the original situation. One, um, we have tried to elevate it with what we can within that area. Two, uh, we have kept the area around it uh, with a very simple walk system to allow access for the public. There are already walks that were put in uh, when the uh, entrance road was renovated. Uh, we're trying to keep this very simple and reflect the same type of situation that is at the Tiger logo, which then provides two simple walks up to it and a circulating walk around it. At the base of it would be uh, an area for plantings for seasonal planting. The uh, landscaping it would be very minimal added to the already existing planting because we feel that the important thing is is to show off the monument and invite people to appreciate it and not add a lot of additional uh, material around it. Um, you will see off the corners of the monument are four yellow in, uh, uh, symbols, if you will, indicating the lights. The purpose of those lights in that location is to replicate the uh, the ex the the excuse me the plinths that were at the corners of the fence that Francis showed you in the early location for it. Again, harking back to the historical context of it. No fence, simply because the fence would provide uh, prevent people from coming up to the monument and appreciating it. The type of lighting would be a simple bollard light, three feet high, low light in the same replica as what is in front of the ASD building, administration building, if you've been there, with um, baffles in the lights so that no uh, flare or glare would come forward or go to the neighbors. Uh, we did chose not to put any light up on the statue, but to keep it low, just to have a very low puddles of light around the base for in the evening uh, so that people, for wayfinding purposes, there's a lot of uh, residual light in the area. Uh, the ASD did not feel it was necessary to overlight the structure and, as I said, specifically do not put light up on the structure. Um, again, it's very simple. Um, let me see if I can go forward here. I'll go back. There we go. Uh, this is a photoshopped image of what it would look like from Main Street, pretty much to scale. Um, I think what we're trying to show here is is the fact that the uh, the the statu excuse me the monument is is located on that center line. That is approximately to scale. Ironically, uh, the administration building has the uh, gabled roof, and so this is aligned right on the gable roof. Um, probably only going to see it when that exact instant that you pass it, but it's there nevertheless. <laughs> Uh, um, I would say that um, we have um, presented the project to design review. Design review gave it a unanimous approval. Um, they were also very kind to compliment the, des uh, the design, saying that they thought it was a very elegant solution, and they were very appreciative of the ASD for approaching it. We presented it to the Historical Commission. They were very enthusiastically gave it their unanimous approval, too. Um, so in conclusion, I'll change my glasses here. Um, there are four points that um, town council is concerned about, uh, specifically with section 177-45C, and if I can read them, one, the design and architecture of the proposed improvements shall be in harmony with the surrounding buildings and adjacent properties. Uh, we feel it is. Um, it, this building is situated within a, a, an older section of housing. Um, 
it is not tight up against any, so you're not putting the monument up against a, a, a discordant structure. Um, it is sitting by itself in a large grass area, 120 feet, as I said, back from the road, uh, complementing what is around it. The scale of it certainly is in scale with the surrounding structures uh, when you consider the height of the vegetation around it. So we feel that that one that is, um, meets that criteria. Number two, <clears throat> excuse me. The proposed improvements shall be in harmony with the overall objective of the plan of development and a comprehensive plan. We feel it is. Um, as many of you West Hartford residents have seen what has transpired with the ASD, it is growing. Uh, if you reflect back on what I said about the axis, the axis that's driven through the site drives everything. Originally, uh, when the first discussions came, we say, well, could we find some place to perhaps put it behind the administration building in the large courtyard which is back there? The decision was made very earlier, no, bring it forward, bring it into the community. And if we bring it into the community, it will first of all, benefit the community, benefit the ASD, but it will also work within the overall plan because after all these many years, um, the ASD is starting to fit all the bits and pieces of its campus together. And so this kind of is, is the centerpiece, it's the nexus at the front of the campus. So we feel that has been accomplished. Three, there should be no impairment to visibility affecting the safety of pedestrians and vehicular traffic. Um, it's 120 feet back from North Main Street, it's six feet wide. I, I don't see that there's any issues with that. <laughs> Four, there shall be no adverse effect on the value of adjacent properties. We feel it will not have an adverse effect because it is harmonious with the general feel of it. If anything, um, perhaps because of the general neighborhood fabric, perhaps that neighborhood you know, would find that their, their values would increase because of the fact that it's a unique. It's a unique situation to have in a, in a city or a town. Um, people passing along North Main, Main Street can't help but notice the significance of it. Um, I would like to think that the neighbors would also appreciate the fact that such a, a, an elegant um, monument would be within their neighborhood. Uh, addition to that, it is not big. It is only 20 feet tall. Um, there's a lot of trees around it that are, that are taller. Um, in conclusion, I would also say that aside from the eight, from uh, um, DRAC and also um, historic, that the various um, uh, departments in the town have looked at it. You probably have it in your package. They find no problem with it all, uh, whatsoever. Um, so with that, um, if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer them. And we thank you for your time. Um, thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions for? Comments, questions? I do have a one question. I'm not sure. Um, maybe Mr. Miller, I'm not sure. But uh, it w so there were some plaques that were preserved or will be preserved to place there. Will they tell the history or will there be information for people to understand the history that we saw and the significance of? As, uh, as far as added, added information. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Did we talk about that at all? I think there, there was some discussion about that. So, Jeff. Okay. Put, it right, put it up to the mic if you can. Okay. That would be helpful. <laughs> okay. uh, uh. Thank you. Maybe you already saw in the Hartford Current um, recently, perhaps maybe three or four weeks ago, there was an article related to the monument. There's a lot of publicity about this already. So, again, I want to make, develop some kind of booklet that it will be distributed to the community if they're interested, and it'll be part be put on our website and website is out as well to give the information to show people further details if so want to have that. Thank you. I, I'm wondering if it might even be helpful to put a little plaque just saying on the uh, visit the website to you know, or something like that. To, I don't. I don't know if they're to understand the, the history of the art. And yeah, that, that, that's kind of interesting, and, and maybe even one of those things you can take a photo of, and it might, yeah, bring you right there. Um, I, from, from a conservation perspective, I, I really um, don't like having a lot of signage around the monument. It really detracts from it, I think. So, but if something that small that had some, some small amount of information or maybe a way up to, on the walkway approach, um, that's something we could certainly work with um, the school with the, the design the other question I had I think that's right but the other question I have too is if something could be placed at the no our, our historical uh, society West Hartford Historical Society too to have 
that documentation there and have people directing them to. Right. Well, the, the information that I've developed with the PowerPoint, we're going to try and expand that and, as Mr. Brabin said, um, uh, d design a booklet. And then that could also chronicle the treatment as well. And then that could be distributed to the historical society and the library or any other body here within town that might be interested in having that information. Because it, it really is a pretty remarkable monument. Um, it's, it's, it's impressive. It is. Um, and they, and they, yeah. not only is the monument itself, they, all of the related history and how significant um, this is. It's, it's a, it, I, I've, I'm Finding it, I'm so proud that you know we uh, we can house it. Because uh, no, oh, that's great. Think, yeah. And sorry for my quick. That's okay. PowerPoint. I was trying to keep it down to our 15 minute slot. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Gold. Okay, you thanks. had a question. Uh, yes, yeah, just a couple quick comments. Um, number one, I thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I think this is an elegant solution to that area, and I think, uh, as you indicated, it'll be a, a great uh, keynote to the the campus, as it were. Um, I think it, it celebrates our history uh, and brings us into our future, and I think uh, the school is a great anchor uh, in the town, uh, and it's important to, to have in the town and continued interest in it from the community. Uh, a couple quick questions, um, and I didn't see. How long will the construction uh, take, number one? Is there any cost to the town for that construction? Uh, I'm assuming no. And then lastly, is there going to be any impact to the North Main uh, corridor there while construction is happening um, <clears throat> the time frame I'm, I'm hoping that we can have all of the work completed before school begins for 20 the 2020 season is that how it works in the fall so I'm hoping by the end of August that it'll be erected and completed um, I don't think there'll be any any way of, of, of causing any sort of uh, traffic issue at all on Main Street because the objects could, we can time them coming in. They can be offloaded on the side access streets going up to the school um, and, and quickly offloaded into the construction uh, area. So I don't foresee that being an issue. The crane that we're going to use for um, actually lifting and the pieces into place should be able to drive right onto the construction areas with the walkway. So it's not going to have to be a large large crane coming from the street or even the the, 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 the school streets um, so I, I can't foresee any any issues like that and in cost I can't imagine how the town would be wrapped up in this for the, in any way with cost but it, do you have anything to add yeah I, I would I would just say that as far as the landscape construction, no. I mean, we're talking bituminous concrete walks, concrete pavers, very, very minimal. I mean, if you saw the construction going on with the Tiger logo, basically the same type of construction, same walk, same that. Um, you might have one truck come in that, that puts down enough gravel to allow the equipment that, um, that Francis said, but, but that would be a one-time shot. The, the construction process would be they would come in in the spring, basically get the site ready, do the basic grading, get the mound ready for the construction of the, uh, and, and also to construct the concrete foundation, pull off the site. And then Francis and his uh, team will then construct the monument, then he will come back, basically wrap it up, cross, cross T's, dot I's, something like that. Yeah, and I have an, uh, one other thing to add is that the conservation of the marble units is actually to happen back up into the school, and so there won't be any type of construction, dust raising, or any anything of, of that nature um, out front. And so um, the actual, um, hopefully, um, re uh, erection of the monument should only be over uh, only a week's period tops, I think. Thank you. Um, Mr. Debra, I think. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I want to commend you, Mr. Stewart, for getting into the record all the things necessary uh, <laughs> to get a, a zoning approval on this particular application. Uh, you hit all the things that we needed to, to look at, and you've got it all on the record, so you've saved me a step this evening, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. DeMay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's also on this uh, site out front in the yard uh, a medallion that recognizes it as a part of the Freedom Trail. And uh, I think that's very important. So uh, the front yard of the ASD uh, parcel is uh, having some uh, historical um, significance uh, to our area. And I think uh, that's, that's very important. And uh, 
it's uh, it's appreciated that we can appreciate uh, these types of things that are happening right here in our community. And uh, to, to sort of piggyback on what the mayor raised, I think it would be an amazing thing, and I don't know if you've thought about this, if you could have some type of video documentary of the restoration, the various components and phases as you do this, and then you can either put it on your website or share it with the community. Because I, I think it's a very interesting story to tell. And Mr. Miller, you did a great job this evening uh, outlining the, the history. Thank you. Thank you. We do plan to put a GoPro camera while it's being renovated. So then we'll show it a time lapse photography of the continued progress of how it was re reconstructed and conserved. So and we we'll post it somewhere for sure. So I, I guess you've hit all the things I think that are, are really uh, significant with this application, and uh, you did a, a good job uh, presenting uh, why it's why it's significant, and uh, I think our community, once this um, project is, is completed. Uh, will be better off and better served. And it's so important that the history of this very significant landmark and institution in our nation's history is located here, is uh, taking the necessary steps to uh, preserve uh, a piece of history that had gone neglected. So uh, tonight, hopefully, we'll get a, a positive approval from, from the council, and uh, you'll move forward to uh, something even uh, bigger and better so thank you thank you are there any other questions or comments no thank you all uh, we'll be you know, taking this up as a vote in our in our agenda soon shortly okay uh, we is there anybody signed to <laughs> blank is there anybody in the audience that would like to uh, speak to this public hearing no okay with that um, I don't have anything to read into the record on my agenda uh, but it's no that's okay there's nothing okay all right and with that we will close the public hearing um, I if you don't mind we're gonna take a five-minute break and be back and start the council meeting thank you so much
I want to start working more with school groups anyway. Okay, let's get back to our we'll start the council okay, meeting. Thank you. Remind me tomorrow. All right, are we all back in? No, waiting on Lynn. Okay, we will call the <laughs> uh, the uh, council meeting, February 11th, town council meeting to order. Uh, start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, Ms. Lebrow. Ms. Blanks. Here. And Ms. Cantor. Here. Mr. Davidoff. Here. Ms. Faye's absent. Mr. Gold. Here. Ms. Kerrigan. Here. Mr. Sweeney. Here. Mr. Winograd. Present. Mr. Williams. Present. And we have alternate, Mr. Donatelli. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Donatelli, for being here. I'm going to start with a proclamation. And Mr. Exum, could you please meet me at the podium? me out because I'm walking by. Uh, so this is a proclamation. Uh, uh, this is uh, at, present. I'm presenting this uh, to uh, Mr. Exum uh, on behalf of Wasco and I will explain a little bit in here but it's Black History Month and uh, it's a very important time for us uh, to reflect and to observe and honor um, all black Americans so all black people around the world um, but specifically um, in West in West Hartford whereas Black History Month is observed every February and this year's theme is African Americans and the vote 2020 an important general election year is also a landmark year for voting rights 2020 marks the 150th anniversary of the 15th amendment 1870 which gave the right of black men to vote following the Civil War and whereas we all learn from history and are enriched by sharing the lessons of the African American stories in our community through research education and civic engagement and whereas in the 1980s, local residents began unlocking the mystery of the only known African American buried in West Hartford's old cemetery center burying yard, uncovering the tombstone, which read, Memory of Bristow, a native of Africa, died March 8, 1814, aged 83 years. And whereas at the time of his death, Bristow had purchased his freedom, was a free African-American who lived much of his life in Hartford's West Division, built a life for himself based on agrarian economy, and earned the admiration of community members of, for his vast agricultural knowledge. And whereas on September 27, 2005, the town officially dedicated the Bristol Middle School in his honor, becoming one of the only schools in the United States to be named after an obscure former slave, and whereas West Harvard continues to do more work towards uncovering the African American history, including initiatives such as the Witness Stones Project, an unvarnished 
project and working with community partners such as West Hartford African American Social and Cultural Organization. And whereas during Black History Month, we celebrate the achievements of African Americans, share inspiring stories of courage and persistence, and study the very painful history in order to expand our knowledge and in hopes of understanding the present and the future. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that on behalf of the Town Council and the residents of West Hartford, I, Mayor Sherry G. Cantor, do hereby join the nation in celebrating Black History Month, recognize the invaluable contributions African Amer Americans have made to our society, and celebrate the achievements of many. Um, and I want to add, actually, that uh, No Webster, um, at the No Webster House on 226, there will be a discussion of the 1619 Project with Dr. Benjamin Foster and Dr. Shayla Nunali from, um, she's a professor of UConn, and it will be a very, very interesting discussion. I also want to thank um, our representative at Exum, who's here to join, and Natalie from Nebraska also. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and uh, Mr. Exum, I don't know if you want to say a few words or. I'll just be brief that uh, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the West Hartford uh, African American and so Social and Cultural Organization, commonly known as WASCO, was founded in 1977 and continues to contribute in our community. Um, just want to reemphasize the 1619 project. It's um, something that the New York Times did last year as a commemoration of 400 years since the first enslaved African was brought to Virginia and into the United States. Uh, it's going to be an inspiring discussion around a great project that researched um, the, the struggles but also the triumphs of the African American community uh, that never accepted slavery as a, as a state that was acceptable and continued to struggle uh, and triumph over it. So uh, if you can join, that'd be great. It's getting so well received that we may move it from the Noah Webster House uh, based on capacity, but, uh, but please uh, stay tuned because we're looking forward to it. Thank you so much. I thank, thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we are on 3A, Mr. David. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I move we receive the Town Council minutes of 128 2020. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, 3B, Mr. Dabrow. Uh, I move that uh, we receive the public hearing minutes of 128 2020 on ordinance sponsorship signs in municipal parks. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, number four is the public forum section of our town council. This is something that is not the subject of a public hearing, but is on the agenda. You need to make a reference to the agenda item that you are speaking to, uh, and you have three minutes to speak unless you are representing an organization, in which case you have five. There's nobody signed up if there's anybody that's interested to speak to anything on the agenda. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, number six, Mr. Davidoff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I uh, move, uh, make a motion to approve an application filed on behalf of the American School for the Death for the Historic Restoration and Reconstruction of the Gallia Debt Monument to be located on the front lawn of the school campus at 137-139 North Main Street. The application includes associated landscape amenities and site lighting. Motion's been made and seconded, and this was a subject of a public hearing uh, um, about an hour ago, uh, and is a, an incredibly um, inspirational project, bringing us back to the hi real sig historical significance of the American School for the Deaf. I actually, uh, when my uh, my son was in college, my oldest son was a freshman, he was taking sign language, and he opened up his textbook, he called me, he opened up his textbook, and sure enough, the first sentence was, America, the American Sign Language was founded at American School for the Deaf, which now resides in West Hartford, Connecticut. I mean, we started in Hartford. So it was pretty a powerful uh, statement. Um, but I think uh, this monument, uh, it is quite a project to resurrect uh, such a, a historic monument, preserve all the pieces to it and all the history. And I, I'm um, so, so grateful for all the people that are involved in making this happen. And I think it will be a real draw for the area, uh, for the region, uh, for history. Um, you know, it will be a message for history. And I, the time lapse video, I'm sure, will be enriching and, and a real learning opportunity for the students in preservation, uh, history preservation, and the meaning that 
there this will have on their front lawn uh, is is remarkable uh, for all of us to see so I, I want to thank everyone uh, that's involved in this and uh, appreciate it so much and uh, mr. Braven is a wonderful leader and I um, really respect uh, all of his vision and uh, the commitment that he's made uh, to preserving this history so with that anybody else Mr. Davis. Uh, Madam Mayor, just for the record, I want to state that the applicant uh, aptly uh, identified all the criteria necessary uh, for an approval of this type of application. And uh, with that, I'll be voting in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Anybody else? Ms. Kerrigan. Yeah, I mean, I, I, unfortunately they left, but I just want to say thank you to them. Thank you to the American School for the Death for investing time and money and energy into a monument that's so important, particularly at a time in our uh, history where monuments are so, um, uh, they're sort of argumented, people are arguing about them, and this is one we can hold proud. Um, fortunately, last year, um, I went to the American School for the Deaf and gave them the proclamation for their anniversary with my son, who is hearing impaired, wears a hearing aid, and uh, learned how to do sign language during hall. Good friend of mine, Lisa Weyerhaeuser, graduated uh, from Gallaudet, so uh, this monument for me, as I drive by there when it's there, will speak volumes to who we are and who Gallaudet is and the meanings of monuments that can keep us proud. So I'll be supporting it, of course. Thank you. All right. With that, all the, oh, uh, yes, we can do roll call, right? Or do we have to do? A roll call. Roll call. Ms. Blanks. Yes, in favor. Ms. Cantor? Yes. Mr. Davidoff? Yes. Mr. Donatelli? Yes. Mr. Gold? Yes. Ms. Kerrigan? Yes. Mr. Sweeney? Yes. Mr. Winograd? Yes. And Mr. Williams? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, 6B, Mr. Davidoff. Hmm, you're all set. Thank you, Mr. Donatelli. Appreciate it very much. <laughs> Have a good evening. Think of us as on your right arm. <laughs> Six V, Mr. Uh, Davis. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I move the, that we continue this item until the February twenty fifth, twenty twenty town council meeting at seven thirty p.m. Uh, we actually have to take. Res uh, oh no, that's right. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, this is the. 7, 6E, oh, I'm sorry, C. the staple is on it, 6C. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I move to take from the table receipt of a communication from Van Grippo dated January 12th, 2020, resigning from the Prevention Council. This item was tabled at our January 28th meeting. Uh, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Davidoff? Uh, Madam Mayor, I move that we receive the communication from Bren Grippo dated January 12, 2020, resigning from the Prevention Council. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you for your service, Mr. Grippo. Uh, number seven, Mr. Davidoff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that we set for public hearing on March 24, 2020 at 7 p.m. and refer to TPZ, Drack, and Krog. An application by the Bridge Family Center, Inc., contract purchaser of the property known as 1021-1023 Farmington Avenue, requesting a change of the underlining zone from approximately 0.21 acres of land on the south side of Farmington Avenue from RM3 multifamily residence to RO residence office and special development district SSDD designation for the reuse of the existing building for professional office use. Uh, and you stated the public here. Yeah. You did all at the beginning. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. 7B, uh, Mr. David. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I move we adopt a resolution concerning state filing for school construction grants. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Hart, you want to address this? Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we are seeking council authorization tonight to allow us to apply for school construction grants for three, uh, three projects that are listed here in the cover memo. Um, for those of you who are not aware, the state has a program in which they will reimburse uh, towns and school districts for certain construction projects conducted in the schools. Uh, they will reimburse a maximum of 80%, and West Hartford's uh, reimbursement is set at 37% at present. So the three projects we are looking to submit are listed here. The first one would be at Hall High School. 
a partial roof replacement of the F wing. That's approximately 7,000 square feet. That section of the roof is uh, 26 years old, has been leaking uh, for some time now. Um, also looking to replace some skylights in that section. The estimated cost of the entire project is 350000 for that one. The second item that we're seeking your approval on is a project at Sedgwick Middle School. This is another partial roof replacement project that we're looking to conduct. That section of roof is also 25 years old, has been leaking for a period of years. The estimated project cost is a little under a million dollars. And then last but certainly not least, a uh, flooring replacement project at Norfolk Elementary School. This would handle the first four classrooms, hallways, other common space uh, storage area. And the flooring tile, uh, we believe, and that this is typical for schools of this age, we're going to have to deal with some asbestos and we'll follow all the appropriate abatement procedures. Estimated cost of that project is uh, $80,000. So you see the uh, totals listed down below. Um, our estimated grant for all three projects would be a little, a uh, little over four hundred and forty-four thousand dollars. The funding for the balance of the three projects is already included in our existing capital improvement program. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Any questions for the town manager? Oh, okay, Mr. Williams. Did you have Thank you, Mayor. So d just so I'm clear, um, Mr. Town Manager, so the funding has already been approved and what we're being asked to do is vote on the grants, which is, would essentially reduce the cost to the town that was already approved. The funding for our estimated share is uh, is approved. You know, we anticipated okay. and we're going to have to upfront the money. You know, that's typical with a project like this. Uh, West Hartford, like many other municipalities in the state, has been participating in this this program for years. And uh, I misspoke. Our uh, our reimbursement rate is actually a little bit higher. I think it's just a tad under 39 percent. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Anything else, Ms. Blank? Um, Mr. Town Manager, just a quick question in terms of the timeline of these projects. Um, I know the district likes to do these things when students are out of school, but we sometimes know that these projects can go a little over. So mm -hmm. can you give me an idea about that? I believe all three projects are scheduled to be completed the summer of this year, summer of 2020. So it would begin right as school um, recess? Yes, that's that's my uh, my understanding. Actually, we do have a, an expert here in the room with us, uh, Chris Cycli. Chris, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, he's with um, the uh, the design company. And can you speak to you? Need to speak from the podium, Chris. Just in response to Councillor Blank's question, I know we're trying to we would work to complete the projects this summer. However, I do not know the exact schedule. I'm not sure if you do off the top of your head. Uh, yeah, so uh, Chris Seikley, Construction Solutions Group. Um, we would submit the grant uh, in March, uh, get the approval to go out to bid in April or May uh, for construction to be over the summer, uh, fully completed uh, by the time students return uh, in September. And then a follow-up with uh, closeout documentation to the state for final reimbursement. Thank you, Ms. Blanks. Any other questions? Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Appreciate it. All right. Um, with that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Uh, 7C, Mr. Davidoff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I move we adopt a resolution to accept a quilt on loan from the West Hartford Art League. Motion's been made and seconded. Mr. Hart, you want to kick this off? I do. Thank you, Mayor. It's transitioning between items. <laughs> so the West Hartford Art League has uh, long served our community, and over the years, you know, they've been very successful in helping to display artwork from various Connecticut artists. Uh, their latest project is an outdoor mural, 
based on four quilts designed by a very prominent uh, Hartford quilter, Ed Janetta Miller. Uh, the mayor and I, and uh, Councillor Blanks as well, we attended the dedication ceremony this past uh, past summer, and it's it's been fabulous. So, the league uh, has offered to us that asked us if we would be willing to display a fourth quilt at Town Hall for a period of three years. You know, we're very excited about that opportunity and, uh, and we're seeking your approval. Uh, also here with me this evening is the, uh, the director of the West Hartford Art League, Roxanne, and Roxanne, I apologize. I am not gonna pronounce the spelling of your last Stahalik. name correctly. The mayor knows, <laughs> very good. But uh, Roxanne has been uh, a fabulous collaborator uh, for us for many years now. So would like to acknowledge her efforts as, uh, as part of your approval here. And I, I, don't, I don't know if you wanna say a few words. I, I'm sure you, would you like to go first? Go ahead, Ms. Blake. Thank you again, Madam Mayor and Mr. Town Manager. Um, so many of you don't know this, but I do have a long history with Edgenetta Miller when I was a very young girl. And this woman is awesome. She is such a talented quilter, recognized not only nationally, but internationally. And as a woman, her spirit sort of embodies her work as an artist. So. I mean, just for the fact that we would host her quilt here in, time, in Town Hall is awesome because of the traffic that we get in Town Hall. Um, our students would be able to identify with a local artist in this community and perhaps we could even invite her into our school district perhaps to do some teachings or whatever you call it in terms of just sharing her talent. So Tom, if you are watching us tonight, just remember that this woman is awesome and she would be a mm -hmm. terrific role model as an artist to our students in this district. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Blanks. Um, I'd love to invite uh, Roxanna to come down and say a few words about the um, not only the, um, the quilt that it will be on loan, but also the, the public art um, display uh, that um, that has been completed and really it enriches all of us. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me and having me here tonight. Um, I've been coming to these meetings when we started our public art program probably in 2006, and I was a regular fixture at town council meetings for quite a while. I'm happy to say I haven't been here for a while. I don't know many of you now because I haven't been here, but um, we started, like I said, back in 2006, trying to get public art initiated in town, and it did take a while, but I'm happy to say that we now have probably eight pieces throughout town. Um, we, ha we installed, we actually purchased and installed the three bronze horses that you see on the town hall grounds by Karen Peterson, who was a West Hartford artist. We put the um, large abstract orange C um, on the grounds. We have a few pieces on our land as well. And this mural is the latest piece. We haven't done anything for about five years. Um, Ed Janetta, as you said, is an incredible artist and we're so lucky to have her here right in our neighborhood. She's not only very well known here, but she's known internationally and she has work in museums all throughout the world. Um, she, and also ironically, since it's um, Black History Month, she is an Afri African American woman. She's from Hartford. She does teach locally, but she also has work at the National Gallery at the Smithsonian. She's got work in the American Craft Museum in New York City the Rocky Mountain Quilt Museum in Colorado. And recently she had work um, put in the Nelson Mandela National Museum in Cape Town, South Africa. She has a lot of work all over the place. She's has been included in a New York Times article as the best of the best. And she's had her work featured on Home and Garden Channel, HGTV, and Public TV in Japan. In other words, we're very lucky to have her here in our neighborhood 
and lucky to have her work exhibited. Um, the mural was made from four quilts that she created, and those four quilts were painted onto a wall twice so that we have a series of eight quilts on over a thousand feet wall owned by the town. The four quilts are then an extension of the public art as they've, they're being displayed throughout town. And what we want to do is display them for three years at a time on loan because we realize nobody really wants us to give them something because then everybody has to figure out what to do with it from there. And we've decided it's easier to loan a piece and have control over it and make sure that it gets transferred to other public locations. So we already have a piece hanging in the West Hartford Public Library. We put one in the Charter Oak Elementary School because we wanted one to be around school children. We have one that will be on permanent display at the West Hartford Art League. And now with this, this would be the fourth and final quit quilt here at the town hall. So um, I've been waiting for this because we will now have them all placed. So I'm hoping this goes well. And we hope that once you see it here, it will encourage you to come out to the Art League, see the mural on our grounds, and go on our website and see the rest of the public artwork and take a tour around town. You know, it's art attracts people to a community. That's what we've been trying to do, and that's what we hope this will help encourage. So thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. How long were you working on this project? This was a very, uh, you were, it was years, um, right? You're this, yes, this has been a while. We applied for a grant from the Roberts Foundation who, you know, I want to thank they have supported the arts in for the Art League so much. But when we first applied for this grant probably eight years ago, um, they give out one a year, we didn't get it. And so I kind of sat on it for a while. It was originally with Ed Janetta. We were trying to figure it out. And then two years ago, we decided to apply again. And we were very pleased that it was able to go through. In that time, Ed Janetta's work has just grown immensely. And she's become very popular. And we were afraid we probably wouldn't even be able to get her. So we were glad that it transpired. Thank you, and I, I want to thank you on your leadership, your persistence, I think, with, with this project and all of the, actually the public art projects, some of them thank not you. so easy uh, to accomplish. Um, art is uh, it, it was enriching, but people do have opinions, <laughs> too, sometimes. Um, and I just want to thank you for making thank our you, community sir. more beautiful and meaningful and uh, for all the time and, and uh, work that you put into the Art League. And thank you all for your support. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations, and thank you so much, Roxanne. Uh, number eight, reports from the town manager. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mayor. Very short report this evening. Uh, first, under council business and meetings, we're going to hold a special town council meeting just a couple days from now, uh, 5.30 p.m. on the 13th here in this room. And the purpose is to receive a presentation from the MDC regarding its proposed integrated plan. They'll also be available to take your questions uh, any questions you might have regarding water rates. Uh, Finance and Administration Committee is scheduled to meet at 6 o'clock on the 18th, and I am seeing a typo that I need to, to fix. Your next council meeting is scheduled for 7.30 p.m. on the 25th, not the 23rd. Uh, moving on to staff reports. Um, good news on the grand list. You should have received a communication from, uh, from me last week. Um, we, uh, for those of you who are, who are new, uh, we update the uh, the grand list for the October October first of each and every year. So the uh, the growth in the grand list for October one two thousand nineteen, it's uh, double the increase from the previous year, and actually, it's the most sizable increase we have seen over the last decade in a uh, nine reval year. Overall, the grand list increased by a little over fifty two million point uh, eight two percent. Uh, over the previous year, so we have a new total of uh, 6.368 uh, billion. That's that's our, our grand list of all taxable uh, property here in town. Um, you know, this year's re, uh, growth. You know, we we did see sizable growth um, for on a percentage basis for personal property, as well as uh, motor vehicles. When you look at real property uh, buildings. Um, the growth this year resulted primarily from the conversion of the former Yukon property from tax exempt to taxable. 
Uh, Dalimar is now fully on the list. Uh, Target at Bishop's Corner, various units at Ringgold Estates, um, the, uh, the built units at Gled Hill Estates, 16 new residential homes, as well as a variety of residential remodeling projects all, uh, all led to this. So I'd like to thank our assessor, uh, Joseph Dakers, um, and the members of his team for their good work in uh, putting the list together each and every year. And uh, thank our community development team for their economic development work. Uh, a couple of other items I'd like to touch on this evening. Recycle Beyond the Bag. I think this is a pretty neat program. Our Land Trust and Rotary Club are partnering with our Public Works Department to sponsor a new plastic film recycling program that will enable us to recycle things that aren't accepted for single stream recycling. What are we talking about? What are film plastics? So those can include produce and uh, bread bags, ice bags, newspaper sleeves, any, uh, any number of related project, uh, products. So starting this month and continuing through the end of July, we're gonna have collection bins placed at four areas of town. One here in uh, the town hall lobby, um, at our recycling center, the Elmwood Community Center, and the Bishop's Corner Library to take in this stuff. And our goal is to collect roughly 500 pounds of this material. Uh, Trex Company, which I think you're probably all familiar with, they manufacture uh, decking and other building projects. They have a program where they will take this material and you know, if we're able to collect up to a certain amount, they would donate uh, a bench to us. That's just a, a small incentive for doing this good work. Uh, related, on a related point, we have hired our new and first ever recycling coordinator. It's a part-time position, and I'm pleased to welcome longtime resident Catherine Bruns uh, to that role. So in that role, she'll be helping out, working with John Phillips on a variety of uh, education and recycling tasks. Uh, moving on, the North Main Street Bridge project is scheduled to begin in late March. That's going to be an 18-month construction. During the construction period, we're going to have to reduce from four lanes to two lanes, one lane in each direction. So we really are encouraging our motorists uh, to seek alternate routes. The bridge was built in 1901. As you know, one of the very first concrete bridges in, uh, in Connecticut. Uh, there are some other things in, in my report, Mayor, that the Council can read at your leisure. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Hart. And actually, Sedgwick did a similar film drive, and they also, it was, it was so impressive. They had, I think, half the room was like bags of bags. Of bags. It was uh, really remarkable. Uh, any questions or comments for the town manager? No? Okay. With that, we go to announcements. Uh, we'll Playhouse Theater Group Internship Program is a great way for young theater professionals to learn and grow both professionally and personally. This program allows college students and graduates to have hands-on experience, uh, including business office, marketing development, liter literary education, front of house, stage, man stage management, costumes, and production. Uh, so it's a great opportunity. Registration is also open for girls softball 38th season, calling all girls ages 4 through 9th grade to sign up for a new and for another exciting season of softball. The league emphasizes skill development while having fun and making new friends. Register online by March 8th at uh, www.whsoftball.com. West Hartford Food, and that's all in caps if you're looking online, a cookbook sponsors, supports Weha Unified Business Club. Holland Connors Unified Business Club compiled the cookbook with recipes from some of our favorite community leaders and friends in West Hartford. I actually have a really good chocolate chip cookie recipe that I don't share with many people. It's very good. Uh, it is beautifully illustrated and contains some quirky facts about West Hartford. Get yours today for $24. Use promo code CROOKSHANKS for 15% off. Uh, to order, go to W www.wehighunified.com free delivery in West Hartford exclamation point um, and comprises students uh, the Unified Business Club comprises students both with and without disabilities who work to create businesses for students with disabilities uh, population explosion a look at West Hartford between the world wars the public is invited to a lecture at the Noel Webster House on February 12th 
um, tomorrow at 6 p.m. for an in-depth look at the demographic change in West Hartford from 1920 to 41, when the population of West Hartford nearly quadrupled from 9,000 to 34,000 residents. Jeff Murray, longtime museum researcher and volunteer, will share his detailed work with voter registration records during this period of extreme population growth and some of the interesting tales he learned along the way. The lecture is free. Pride and Prejudice Playhouse on Parks season continues with Kate Hamilton's show running February 19th to March 8th. Tickets for performances are now on sale, ranging from $30 to $40. Romance de la Guitarra <coughs> Romance is a captivating concert, lovingly conceived, I'm sorry for that, uh, around the theme of Valentine's Day. The program is, uh, features Spanish classical guitarist Daniel Salazar and his ensemble of international musicians. A uh, special Valentine's Day program will be held February 14th at 8 p.m. at Hoffman Auditorium at the University of St. Joseph. Purchase tickets in person or online at sju.edu. Mom's Voices, Celebrating Diversity and Empowerment, join the Community of Concern for Mom's Voices uh, panel discussion on Thursday, February 20th at Conard High School, Room 169. Seven West Hartford Public School moms from diverse backgrounds will share their experience and thoughts about our community, moderated by retired WHPS Administrator Nancy De Palma. Drinks and light Syrian refreshments will be served, and Nancy is funny, so it should be a really enlightening and warm and wonderful program. Um, and and when uh, we were talk when Roxanne was talking about borrowing quilts, I thought how nice it would be to borrow kids, <laughs> kind of share the ownership. Anyway, um, the 1619 project, a conversation that we talked about before, uh, is on February 26, 6 p.m. Uh, led by Dr. Benjamin Foster, and it includes a panel discussion with historians on the 1619 project. Any other announcements or? Oh, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, well, first I want to give uh, credit for these annou announcements to Ronnie, and thank you for keeping us in the loop. But this week there were some pretty big sports accomplishments that happened at uh, alumni at Conard, uh, Dallas, and um, Mr. Williams would be very happy about this. But uh, we had a young lady named Azalea Fedler who, who accomplished a 1,000 points in her, by her junior year and will, I think will be the all-time leading scorer in Conard history when she's all, all done, so that's a pretty big accomplishment. But <clears throat> the biggest one I saw was Gavin Sherry of, of Conard, who was named Connecticut's Gatorade Boys Cross-Country cross Runner of the Year, and that is the first time anyone at Conard has ever been named that, and that's just that's a huge deal in any sport, and so I just wanted to recognize those student athletes for that's some that's pretty pretty awesome stuff happening in our town. So very impressive. Thank you for sharing. Uh, anything else? Okay. Um, reports from Corporation Council, Mr. Dodge. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, unfortunately, I'm not bringing you eighty-five thousand dollars again this week. <laughs> Um, but I am very pleased to announce the promotion of Gina Verano in my office to the position of Deputy Corporation Counsel. Uh, this is a position that was previously filled by my predecessor, Pat Allaire, who I believe was in the, in the deputy role for about 20 years uh, before he retired and became the Corporation Counsel and has been left vacant uh, since the retirement of Kimberly Bonham. And it's a position that is absolutely critical uh, for the town. Uh, the Deputy Corporation Council will manage the day-to-day -day <coughs> operations of my office and will also serve as the Corporation Council, uh, will also serve as the Corporation Council in my absence. Um, Ms. Verano has a very impressive rem uh, resume. She came, she comes to us uh, from the city of Hartford where she reminds me uh, there's almost no emergency that she has not seen. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the few weeks that I've had to work with her uh, and in the year that I had to work with her on council, I have been very impressed by her professionalism, uh, her experience, and the judgment that she brings to the job. And I know that town staff uh, feel similarly. So congratulations, Gina, and we're very pleased to, uh, to have you. Uh, and also, Madam Mayor, uh, I know that we had an executive session on the agenda for tonight, and we will not require that this evening. There's some key staff uh, who were unavailable tonight uh, who will need with us when we when we brief you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dodd. Oh, so sorry. Not really. <laughs> um, and congratulations, Attorney Verano. Thank you. It's a, appreciate all of your your work, and uh, we're, we're lucky to have you. Um, 
Any questions for Mr. Dodge? All right, uh, number 11, appointments. Um, I have a Karen Harrington appointed to the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District for a term ending 12-31-2020. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Um, we have no, nothing on consent. Uh, no communication. Oh, no, we do have one communication. Number 14, Mr. David. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I uh, move that we receive a uh, letter from Harriet Winograd uh, resigning from the Commission on Veterans Affairs. Second. Motions we made a second, and I want to thank Harriet for her service. Uh, it's a commission that has done really great work, and um, I re we really appreciate all that she, she has done. Uh, no petitions, uh, no executive session. Uh, with that, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motions we made a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Good night.